Well, good morning. Welcome to any first-time uh, visitors. We're glad to have you here with us, and I pray you'll be blessed as we worship our God together. We're studying through Romans, and we are in chapter 1, uh, but Lord willing, we are going to finish that chapter here this morning. Uh, I have a friend who went to Southside for a long time, and he told me he's memorized uh, all of Romans chapter 1. He has two verses left, and he's retired, and he's just still laboring to, to memorize these scriptures. So keep working on your memorization with those fighter verses and meditating and praying over and studying deeper. Many of you have told me the commentators you're using, and I just rejoice in, in how everyone's laboring to understand deeper this glorious gospel that God has given to us. Uh, we are looking at the gospel then that Paul is eager to preach in Rome. The gospel that he's unashamed of because it's the power of God to bring us into salvation. And now Paul is starting to dig deeper into the gospel as he is unfolding it to us in Romans. And he begins in verse 18 with the bad news first. Three chapters that we would understand what is our true condition and our true state before God. And I don't want you to run to other people or psychology to understand your true condition before God, to come to Scripture and say, God, what is my status before you? I need to know this. I, I must get to the truth. And it says that we are under sin. And what does that mean? And what does it look like for three chapters? To show that sin is not an S chromosome that's passed down, but it's a, a power. And it's a dominion over us. So much so that Paul says we were slaves to sin. We were under its control. It was our master. And it's such a mighty power within the hearts of men and women and children that it, it corrupts them and it binds them and it blinds them to the truth. And so to show that we cannot pull a Houdini or something and just get out from under it, Paul has been like a skilled surgeon opening up our hearts to show us the depravity that fills our hearts and that we're 10,000 leagues under the sea, we're out of breath, we have no ability to get out from our condition and our predicament. We have no hope of rescue in ourselves. And so I have the goal to show that there is only one power that can save us from this condition. Being under sin and thus under the wrath of our Creator God. The gospel is not a patch. It's not a self-help program. It's not a makeover. This glorious gospel is the power of God to save you and to bring you into a beautiful relationship as a daughter or a son of God in perfect fellowship and shalom and peace. What a gospel. And so we need sections like this to marvel again at the depth of the greatness of the salvation that God has given to us. And so to that end, I want us to go before our God and pray this morning. Father, we come before you and I thank you for this gospel. And I thank you, God, what we're going to look at this morning. I pray let every soul in this room honestly look before the living God at their condition and their soul, and that they would be faithful to hear from their God and put off all arguments and put off uh, all, all things that they don't want to hear this morning, God. Let them look at this because this is the only way to get to the remedy. This is the only way to get to the sweet gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, God, I pray there are so many needs in different places that people have walked in here this morning. And God, you are the only one who can work individually into each heart with what they need. And so, God, heal hundreds and thousands of hearts this morning for all who will listen to this sermon. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there was a man looking at the landscape in which he lived, and he wrote the following. All is full of crime and vice. There's more crime committed than can be dealt with by punishment. A monstrous prize contest of wickedness is going on. The de desire to sin increases and shame decreases day by day. Vice is no longer practiced secretly, but in open view. Vileness gains in every street and every heart that to such an extent that conscience is becoming not only extremely rare, but extinct. This was taken from a man named Seneca, a Roman statesman and philosopher who lived at the time of Paul writing about Rome. How does a society get that way? 
How does an individual get that way? And this morning, God is going to give us that answer and we will look it right in the face. And what I want you to see is these verses picture the country that we live in this morning perfectly. It's just going to, you're going to read it and say, this is a day in America. We've suppressed God and we pretend to be wise and all our little theories and, and, and philosophies and we've, we've just suppressed him. And, and the Bible says we become fools when we remove God from it. We exchange the glory of God for our own idols, for the things that we have created to worship. And therefore, what we're learning in this section, the wrath of God is upon us in a present tense way, continual. This is what a society and a person looks like under this condition. And my heart breaks how spot on it is 2,000 years later, is that America is under the judgment of God. So last week, we saw the reasons for God's wrath in verses 18 through 23. And this morning, we're going to see the results of it in verses 24 through 32. So here's your outline. We're going to look at three results of God's wrath revealed against those who, last week, they suppress the truth by creation that there's a God, and they push it down, and they use it as an instrument unrighteousness. I, I want my sin. I don't want to deal with God. And you push it down, and, and we're going to see that God brings wrath upon those who do this. The first is the result of impurity. We'll see in verses 24 through 25. The second is going to be the result of an unnatural impurity in verses 26 through 27. And then we're going to see the result of a depraved mind in verses 28 through 32. Before we begin, I want to remind you one more time that the first, first comes religious degeneration where we deny God and we suppress Him. And then comes moral degeneration as a fruit of what we do with God. So all of the brokenness and sin and destruction in our land, it's a spiritual issue. It's not a moral fix and all of our programs to clean it up are not working because the root issue is what we've done with God. And so I want you to see that, that first, if, you, if you've come and your life is falling apart and broken, it's not just cleaning up your life, it's fixing the root issue. And the root issue is I need to be right with the living God. And so you have to look at this picture that Paul's going to give us for 45 minutes, and I had to spend the whole week, okay? So 45 minutes of just looking at the human heart and its fallen condition. And I pray that you would feel like a debtor this morning at the core of your being to those who are still in the spiral that we will look at. I hope that every one of you have an increased burden for evangelism because of people who are in the spiral and there's no way out in your own strength and God's given a remedy to pull you out of this death spiral. So I'm eager to preach the gospel in Denver and I'm unashamed because it's the power of God for salvation. So if you've come, I have a gift for you this morning if you're stuck in this spiral. And so I, I want to pray one more time. You can't pray too much in church, okay? You can't pray too much anywhere. So let's go to our God. God, I, I just have a heart for anyone that might be stuck in this spiral this morning, God. Let them, let them be faithful to hold still and, and let the great physician tell them their diagnosis. God, let the, let the life shine right into their mind and their hearts so that now the great physician can remove the heart of stone and give them one of flesh and heal them this morning with this gospel. God, I pray, have, have your way in our midst and do for us what we need in the power of this gospel. Amen. First, the result of impurity. If you look with me in verses 24 through 25, where we left off last week. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. Therefore, once again, it's so important the way Paul uses it throughout Romans. And it's really right now, it's like a lawyer who's come and he's presented all of his evidence. And now he says, therefore, I want you to find my client not guilty. 
So in light of all this, I want you to make these conclusions. And Paul is now saying, therefore, because you've suppressed God and creation and all that you've done, therefore, the argument is the atrocity of treating God like this. He, I, I don't know how more he could say it. He made it evident. He told them within them. He, he, it just, he just keeps showing you again and again that you knew God. And, and so there was, there was the clear fingerprint in creation that demands there is a God. I love that painting illustration. I've been thinking about it all week. I'm going to say it again for anyone visiting. Let's take the Mona Lisa. And everyone gathers around in an art gallery and they're looking at it and they're amazed and they're talking about the beauty. And some guy just looks and says, you know what? That wasn't created. It just happened. You'd you'd throw him out of the art gallery. And I've been driving around all week looking at this creation saying, this is clearer than any painting that's ever happened. God has made it so clear that you're without excuse. You can't deny it. And when you suppress it and and go worship something other than this creator, God's wrath comes forth. He's he's not happy about us. He he made it so evident that we would honor and give him thanks. He made it so that it would just be obvious to every created being. And we look at it and we say, I don't want this. I want my sin. And so three times in our text this morning, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. This is God's wrath to one who is culpable and inexcusable for his response to God. When the glory of God is suppressed, to exchange it for an idol is huge. It's a big deal to God. And it brings 10,000 troubles and sins and brokenness into our lives and into our society. When we won't have our Creator to be God and give Him glory and the thanks that He is worthy of, wrath is revealed against us. The horrors of exchanging the glory of God for anything else. He gives them over. I don't think there's anything that could be more worse that we could hear. God gave them over. He just lets them go. You want your sin more than me? I made me so obvious. And you want your sin more than me? Have it. You won't give me the honor that I deserve? I will let you dishonor yourselves in sin and debauchery. I'm going to cause you to act like animals who are unreasoning. If you won't use your mind for me, you want me out of your mind? Well, you're going to be out of your minds in sin. I give you over. The punishment fits the crime. It's an heiress, just a snapshot of, I gave them over. God gave them to their unrighteousness that they wanted. You chose to have your sin rather than God. Have it. And you'll drink it to its fullest. Sin destroys And it destroys relationships and marriages and families and churches and cities and nations and souls and eternities. What sin has done to us? I've never hated it more in my life. And he gives them over to what? And their lusts and their hearts. The lust of their hearts for impurity at the innermost being of their core. I just want impurities and lusts and desires, and I want that more than you, God. All right, have them. Ephesians 2, 3, Among them we all too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. God's just giving them over to their lusts. And I don't know anything that describes our society better than just a country given over to its lusts. We're drowning in the pig slop. And we've just been given over to our lusts and destroying ourselves again and again, daily, daily. This sin rules and reigns our country. So that their bodies would be dishonored among them. The word means disgraced. Their bodies would be disgraced among themselves. They would not honor God as God, so they're dishonored. Sexual perversion of our day, when Hollywood puts on movies called Fifty Shades of Grey and people flock to it. Websites, prostitutes, and 
Tinder and the porn industry, human trafficking, homosexuality and rape. You want us to take a sip out of a 20-foot wave? Have it. But it's going to take you away and it's going to destroy and shipwreck your life. God gave them over and the destruction is devastating and I see it on a daily basis. The results and the pain and the disease and the hurt and the children and the broken homes and relationships, this is just devastation what has come by us doing this to God and suppressing Him and not having Him be our God. It said that the average male can't go five seconds without thinking of a sexual thought. What has happened to image bearers of God? I won't have God, and what this will do to you is unbelievable. Paul wrote in Corinthians, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. In verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. The Greek word for lie is pseudo, where we get the word pseudo. They traded the truth of God for a made-up God, for one that fits them and one that they want and one that they can live any way they want in their unrighteousness. So they've given up truth and they've moved to a lie. They worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. What could be crazier? (laughs) The creator of it all? I don't want you. I want the things that you made. I want to love those things and give my heart and time and worship and devotion to that. It's all a big lie. The glory of God must be second to none. We must worship God who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul's passionate. The wrath of God, he gave you over to your impurity. And you're just going to burn and and fall apart and destroy yourselves in this area. Uh, You want it? Here you go, have it. Oh, God. The second result is what I'm going to call an unnatural impurity in verse 26. (coughs) For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also men abandoned the natural function of the woman, and they burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. I understand that this is probably one of the most controversial territories in our land, in our society, in the entire Bible. In June of 2015, the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage in America. And the empowerment that came to the LGBTQ was just catapulted at that point. And now the, the teaching of the Supreme Court is pitted against the teaching of God's Word. The teaching of the Bible now has been under amazing attack on this issue where whole denominations are embracing the culture's teaching on this. One former lesbian who was a college professor by the name of Rosario Butterfield said, homosexuality is the nation's reigning idol. So I'm aware of the consequences of holding to God's clear word on these matters. But only God's clear diagnosis can bring you to God's powerful healing and salvation. So the only way to love anyone in any of the sins that we will look at this morning is to tell the truth of what God says about it and to find a gospel that there's a way to be healed and remedied and fixed. It's not to rename it and ignore it and call it by cute names. I'm on a mission of love this morning to speak the truth and love to every heart that has come here. And so what I want to do is I want to exegete these verses. I want to draw out God's meaning and and not put in the meaning that, that, that we want it to say, just God's clear meaning. And I want to tell you what God says on this issue in Romans 1 and then make application about it without letting it take over the main flow of this section. So the whole message must be kept together. Where I see where trouble comes is when you break it apart. It's not intended to stand alone. Uh, There's three giving over. This is just one right in the middle. And the power of this section and the whole portion is to understand it. So that's my goal this morning. So look with me in verse 26. For this reason, what, what reason? Don't miss this. This is a big, important issue. For this reason, 
God gave them over to to grating passions because they they won't have God to be God. And they suppressed him and said, I want sin and I want to worship idols. For that reason, God gave them over again to degrading passions. To degrade someone is to insult them or to lower them in moral value. (laughs) It's eroding the good into the evil. Degrading meant without honor in the Greek. So it's a dishonorable passions. Passions are your inner desires, our our thumias, our epithumias that pull us away from the creator into this degrading condition that Paul is describing here in our text. God gives them over now to degrading passions. It's an escalation in impurity. They were given over to impurity And now they're given over to degrading passions. And so this is not something to be celebrated or paraded. Cannot be. This is an interesting statement by Paul, thus the Holy Spirit of God. The exchange has been made in our passage. So they exchanged the revelation of God and creation for nature, for created things. Then he says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And now they're given over to what violates human nature itself. Again, an exchange is made from that which is natural to that which is unnatural. Here's the progression. Nature itself tells you this, says God. And Paul's going to give two illustrations to show what he means so you do not misunderstand what he means. The first one is somewhat surprising. This is the only passage in Scripture that mentions lesbianism. In fact, it's hardly mentioned at all in any ancient literature. And Paul pulls it out first. And he says that the women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. What is Paul saying? The natural function is there's a maleness to the male body and there's a femaleness to the female body. And this is all the evidence we need to see that the woman was made for the man and the man was made for the woman, as well as Genesis 2 when God created and designed it that way. It is natural, it is God's created order, and it's God's beauty and it's God's design that he has made. And it's to bring blessing to those in the covenant of marriage and marriage alone. So there has to be the suppression of truth to misunderstand gender. To have the exchange of God for an idol, to give up the truth of God for a lie. God gave them over to this degrading of their bodies, forsaking that which is natural for the unnatural. So Paul brings the the lesbian activity first, and then he proceeds to the homosexuality in verse 27, if you'll read it. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And so Paul makes it even clearer what he is saying in these verses so that it's unmistakable and you cannot miss what he's writing about. It cannot be confused. They burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their heir. And so this is so important because this passage not only tells me that homosexuality is against nature, but it tells me how someone becomes one. So that you're not born this way. There are three exchanges that are made. In the first exchange, we, we've gone over all three, and God says that this, this exchange has brought my wrath. And he gives you over then to degrading lust and defilement. This is the only way to help somebody is to love them enough to tell them this because there, there's a way to be remedied. There's a way to be rescued for every sin in this passage, not just one sin. Every sin in this passage, there's, there's a way to be saved from it. And so I'm going to say something that many preachers will not say today, but I'm convinced that I cannot truly love a homosexual without telling them this. 
I don't believe that most homosexuals believe that they have chosen to be so. And this passage tells us it's a choice. It's an it's a exchange that you willfully made. Every sin is a chosen sin in this passage. Every one of them. And so heterosexual or homosexual, young or old, we're culpable and we're responsible for every sin before God. And all of our arguing and all of our persuading and even gaining acceptance in society will not change the truth of God and what he calls for his followers to do. You can't change God. You can't change his will. You cannot turn this. And hurts in the past and hurts that you have today cannot change this truth. It's a choice. And it's a result of not having God to be God and giving him thanks as our creator. So God gave him over. And so many, so many in our day have not loved homosexuals by not speaking the truth about the depth of this sin and the root of it is in idolatry and to help them see what it is. And accordingly, many have sinned by not speaking the truth and the love of God to help them see this sin and find God's great deliverance from it, again, like every other sin in this passage. And so you better speak the truth in love and care. Don't make excuses for it. There's a better, there's, there's a better way to stand righteous before God on the last day, and it's this gospel. And so you can make excuses, and you can say, I'm born this way. I'm only married to one partner. I'm monogamous. Scripture doesn't say this. It's against nature. That would be for a heterosexual to have a homosexual relationship. That's what Paul's talking about. Paul had not discovered all that we have discovered about sexuality in our day. Society approves it. In verse 32, he tells you that they're going to clap and approve it. Paul was just driving the dogma of his day, of his culture, except at the time that Paul wrote this, homosexual love was considered a superior love in society, most of the emperors were gay, including Nero. And the last argument is, I don't want a God who does not see this as beautiful. And that's the problem of our passage. I don't want a God like that. I want my unrighteousness. And that's the root issue. And so it's true when you say that. And there's a way to heal it. There's a way to fix this. But the sign of God giving you over is this sin. And I won't dress it up and I won't give it nice names, but repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be forgiven and be justified where God declares you not guilty before him and he adopts you into his family as a son or daughter. Renew your mind to think God's thoughts then about sexuality just like heterosexuals must do in the same way as born-again children of God. We've got to renew our minds to think God's thoughts in this area. And there's a power in this gospel to do that, to save you from sin's guilt, its penalty, but also its power, and one day, its presence forever in glory. So, how do you reach out to a people who are given over to this, and they believe that the church doesn't love them at all? And sadly enough, there are places in the church that don't. And I pray if any of you have that in your heart that you would repent deeply this morning because you don't understand that you were in this spiral of Romans 1. Every one of us walked in this. And you need to have a compassion for anybody who's in uh, depravity and lost. We had a, a lesbian couple that worked at our local Dazbog. And Laura and I just began loving this little couple with all of our heart and invited them over for dinner. And they said, you, you guys can't be Christians. You're, you're nice to us. I just thought, how did you get that? Maybe, she, maybe they're, they're twisting things that were said or maybe people really treated them that way. 
And I pray that there would never be a saint at Southside Bible Church that would ever not love anybody in the bondages of sin. Homophobic, throw that out. Get rid of it. We love and we speak the truth to everybody in sin that they could know this God and be delivered. Scandals on the left in the church, it doesn't tell the truth about homosexuality. It even ordains it as, them as ministers. There's scandals and the conservative Orthodox evangelicals who know the truth and we know the answer, but at times we don't reach out in compassion and truth as we ought, and we need to repent of that. Humility. I'm in Romans 1. God opened my eyes to see the glory of Christ and his righteousness to me. I'm a debtor to all men. I came out of that chapter. I, I owe a debt to everyone, and I love every one of them, and I want to tell them the truth of what God can do for them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be a debtor to all men. Thirdly, the result of a depraved mind in verses 28 through 32. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled to the brim is the Greek word with all unrighteousness, and he's going to give us a list. And so we don't want God. That's depravity right there, that a heart wouldn't want God, the creator. I don't want God. And then it says they did not see fit. The Greek word was dokimos, when you'd put that metal and test it, and, and the approved part would come out, the purified gold, so that it's to prove by testing. And so they did not deem God fit after testing him to have him in their knowledge. I don't want God. He's not worthy of my thoughts or my attentions. I suppress it. I don't want it. And they would not acknowledge God any longer. Epinosis. They didn't want a full knowledge of God. They didn't want to seek him out to know this creator and what creation is preaching. I don't want that kind of knowledge. I want it out of my mind. The unsaved want to have their minds on other things than the glory and majesty of God. And God says, okay, you want corrupt thoughts? I'll give you over to them. And God gave them over. It says to deprave minds, and that's the word adokimas. And that was when that metal was put in the fire. The adokimas was the impurities that boiled off. It was the rejected impurities. <clears throat> so they look at God and say, you're worthless. You're useless. I don't want you, God. God gives them over. The mind that finds God worthless, I want you to hear this, becomes worthless itself. God rejects this mind and he gives it over. And he lists 21 evils that will come from a mind like this. This whole section is a picture of the kind of things that flow out of a heart when God gives it over. It's not exhaustive, but it's to help us understand what happens. Take God out of your mind. And there's just no restraints to how evil our heart can become. And so I want you to listen. We'll go through these quickly. You'll be filled with all unrighteousness. It, it, that, that's what we suppress the truth with, our unrighteousness. And it, and it meant to the brim, overflowing. Wickedness is out of chaos, which is not righteous. There's a wickedness. There's a greed. That there'll be covetous and passion for more. I just want more, more, more. I'm never satisfied. There's going to be an evil, just a, a general inclination to evil. They're going to be full of envy. They're just jealous of anybody that has more than them. They're going to murder. There's going to be strife, which means contention and quarreling and wrangling, deceit, treachery to ensnare the unwary, unwary for personal gain, malice that sets others against to harm them, and gossips, the information that's spread in secret and harmful to others' reputations. Slander takes gossip one step further. It's done openly now to defame. And so all of this is just, a, again, a day in America. Pull up, pull up any social media and you just listen to... I, there was, I, I read this funeral that happened and everybody's under there just bashing and slamming. I mean, someone died. And we're still throwing out all our opinions and bashing and slamming and slandering and being malice and full of strife and deceit. God-haters, insolent, pride that sets a human being up against God. And we're arrogant. We have a high opinion of self. We're boastful, inventors of evil. The, the old ways are dull, so we just keep coming up with new ways. 
<laughs> will disobey parents. Senseless, without understanding the things of God. Faithless, can't be trusted. Heartless, this Greek word means to not have a natural affection that God has put in every human being. I'll give you over to where you'll abort babies and fathers will walk away from families and just natural love that God has put within human beings will begin to corrode and be taken away and we'll lose that even in our own society. And they'll be ruthless as they'll be without mercy. If I could describe our country more than anything, it's without mercy. No mercy. Guys, these are the ways that depravity expresses itself. The horror of our choice of suppressing God. As if it could get any worse in verse 32. <clears throat> and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things, they're worthy of death. They know this. So they, they know there's a God. It's, it's, it's evident within them. God made it evident. And they even know if they live this way and act this way, they're going to be judged by God. I'm worthy of death. So they not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. They have parades and, and they honor and they celebrate it and they just run around just exalting this and they're just proud of it. Here it is. Sin. Come sin with me. And we laugh about it and we joke and we drink beers and tell stories and we're all just hanging out, celebrating our sin. We not only do these sins, but we get others to do them as well. We're all spiritual Dr. Kevorkians. We want to kill each other and destroy each other in our sins. We delight when others roll around in the mire with us, and we high-five each other for it. This country glamorizes immorality. And then when they die, we talk about why they're in heaven with God. They not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. What I want you to see this morning is suppressing the truth of God is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And if anyone's come in here and you're just saying, God, I don't want you to be God, and maybe you're, you're, you're lying to yourself saying, I want you to be God, but you're holding to your unrighteousness and you won't bend and surrender to this God, this this is a dangerous thing, and God is angry. His wrath says, you don't want me? I've made it so clear that I'm God in creation. I'm going to give you over. And what's going to come out is the death spiral that I just described, that I lived in, and you lived in, and people are living in this morning. And this is what Paul's writing. Nobody can pull out of that death spiral. A little religion can't fix this. Pulling yourself up by the bootstraps cannot stop this death spiral. There is nothing that humans can do to stop this. This is the wrath of God. You can't pull out of it. There's a wrath on us. But there's something else being revealed today every time we share the gospel. There's a righteousness. There's a way to be made right with God and to be pulled out of this spiral and to have all your sins washed away and forgiven and to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ where God now smiles at you and accepts you and brings you into his family. There's a way. But it's not to deny it and give it different names and say, woo, I can't hear you. It's to look at this gospel and he says it's to those who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To those who will put their faith in this Christ alone to save them from that spiral and to wash them and cleanse them and give them a new nature and begin to transform them to walk and live the way Jesus did upon this earth. Guys, we have an amazing gospel. And so anyone who is lost in, in just sexual sin, homosexual sin, or the depravity of mind that just hates and slanders and destroys people, wherever you sit this morning, there is a power. I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God to save anyone who will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the remedy. Don't run after anything else. Don't go get drunk so that you can ignore what pastor just said. Look this in the face and then look Jesus in the face and believe and be saved. I'm just going to read a couple of verses and we'll close out. And I just want you to know that I have such a heart for anyone that would be stuck in any one of these sins and I have a compassion and I want you to be set free. 
And if any of you have children or parents or anybody locked into these sins, what I'm going to read to you now is don't despair. There, there is hope no matter where someone is in this death spiral because anyone who's been saved has been in this. So don't lose hope for any unbeliever that you love and care about that's in this death spiral. I want you to hear a couple of verses. Titus 3. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. It sounds like Romans 1. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared in Christ, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, not your good things that you're doing, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, making you new from within and renewing you by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified, not guilty before God, by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Colossians 3. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Romans 1 again. For it's on account of these things the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in that death spiral. But now you also put them all aside, anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech from your mouth. Don't lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self, what you were in Adam with all of its evil practices, and you've put on the new self who's being renewed in a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. (coughs) Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Don't get tricked. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the Spirit of our God. There's a gospel for sinners. A glorious gospel. And we tell the truth of God's diagnosis of our condition. So that will lead us to God's remedy and His Son to make us right before Him and accepted in love by the work of Jesus Christ and not our own doing in our own hands. To the one who will believe he will be justified and saved. Our hope is this glorious gospel. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to come to the communion table and I want your hearts to be so full that that spiral was me. And I'm going to come to this table and I'm going to remember what pulled me out of it. And it was when I looked at Jesus Christ crucified on my behalf. And in that, it gave me a new heart and it's transformed and changed everything. And so I want you to come to this table and remember and and be strengthened and blessed and encouraged with how great a salvation we have because this death spiral would have never stopped unless Christ came and stood in our place. So let's let's, um, have a time. I'm going to pray and then we'll pass out the elements. Father, I come before you and I thank you for such a gospel. Lord, I I know it's hard that we got to have a proper diagnosis uh, most don't enjoy looking at this, but God, for me, it's, it's beautiful because it reminds me of how dark and, and black and hopeless it was. So God, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you made us alive together with Christ. Lord, it's by grace that we've been saved and we give you all the praise, glory, and honor. And God, thank you now for the privilege to sit shoulder to shoulder and remember all that you have done to pull us out of this pit to remove your wrath and now fill it with love and peace. Oh God, we thank you for it. Let every heart now be full in remembering the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen.